Okay, and my presentation is called The Genius of Lego, How Lego Became the World's Greatest Building Toy. Many of the children who have grown up during the past 70 years or so have played with Lego when they were young. During that time, it has grown to be the most successful building toy in the world with billions of Lego bricks produced each year. The Lego group is even said to produce far more tires than any tire company in the world. Lego is a brand recognized worldwide and is enjoyed not only by children, but by many adults who have made Lego their hobby. There's even a term, AFOL, adult fan of Lego. Um, and uh, of course, Lego is not only the building set out there, nor is it not the, nor is it the oldest one. Wooden building blocks have been used by children for hundreds of years, and commercial building sets have been around for over 100 years, including the British construction set Meccano from 1908, the American construction set A.C. Gilbert's Erector set from 1913, the Tinker Toy construction set from 1914, and Lincoln Logs from 1916. Each of these building sets was limited by the ways their pieces connect together, either by screws and nuts, sticks and spools, or notches on the end of logs, respectively. These restrictions also limited the, what kinds of structures could be built from the sets. The Meccano and Erector sets were mainly for building structures made mainly of girders and beams, or machines like cranes, which were likewise constructed from beams. With Tinker Toys, one could make stick and spool constructions with later sets including gears, and in the 1980s, students at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology even used Tinker Toy to construct a computer uh, that could play tic-tac-toe. Lincoln Logs let children build houses and buildings, but only ones limited to the lengths of the logs provided, which connected with each, with each other through notches at 90 degree angles. So while building sets were enjoyed by many children, there were still limits as to what one could do with them. Concurrent with the rise in popularity of building sets was the development of the play set, a toy set with a collection of various elements of which, uh, which are designed around a particular theme or location, which is usually complete in and of itself, unlike a building set. <coughs> it needed little or no assembly. Uh, while obviously less flexible than a building set, play sets featured designs that were usually more representational than the often very abstracted versions of things built from pieces of a building set. Play sets also had more complete and detailed environments than those one could construct with a building set. So let us turn next to the development of the play set. Although they were probably not playsets as we would think of them today, the creation of miniature scenarios dates back from the models found in ancient Egyptian tombs, such as that of Menkenwetra, uh, circa about 2000 BC, uh, which reveal the, what daily life in Egypt was like, with little wooden figures of people, animals, and vehicles set in little wooden buildings and scenes. The earliest dollhouses were produced in the 1700s and 1800s, not as toys, but as educational tools used by mothers to teach their daughters household management. Some later dollhouses were built as miniature replicas of the owner's house to show off their wealth. It was only towards the end of the 19th century when industrialization allowed objects to be mass produced that dollhouses came to be considered objects for play. The earliest commercially driven play sets then were dollhouses. German companies produced miniatures for collectors in the 19th century, and by the 1920s, dollhouses and their accessories were being produced by American companies like the Tiny Toy Company, who made replicas of New England homes. After World War II, dollhouses and their furnishings were mass produced, making them more affordable and available as toys, but at the same time, less detailed and simplified due to the demands of mass production. Other playsets appeared around the same time from companies like the Tobias Cone Company and Remco Industries, and most notably from the Marx Toy Company, which became one of the largest toy companies in the world during the mid 20th century. Begun in 1919, the Marx Toy Company made plastic metal playsets, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, made metal playsets during the 1930s and 40s, like the Sunnyside Service Station. Uh, from 1934 and the roadside service station from 1935. 
After the development of plastics in the 1940s, production became easier and less expensive, and the number of play sets increased, as did their popularity. In the 1950s, Marx produced more generic sets, like the Western Ranch set of 1951, Cowboy and Indian Camp from 1953, and the Arctic Explorer play set of 1958, as well as sets based on actual events like the Civil War and real places like Fort Apache um, and Fort Dearborn. Other sets were adaptations of existing properties in other media, like the Roy Rogers Ranch set from 1952, Lone, Range Radio, uh, Lone Ranger Rodeo, 1952, Walt Disney's Davy Crockett at the Alamo from 1955, and Gunsmoke Dodge City from 1960. The transmedial nature of these sets, which played on the popularity of existing franchises, helped to encourage the sale of play sets in general. Having a tie-in to a known property became an important part of a play set's marketing. According to Mark's toys collector and historian, Eric Johns, <clears throat> while Ford Apache play sets were the biggest uh, seller for Mark's, uh, quote, while Ford Apache play sets were the biggest, Mark's, biggest seller for Mark's in the long run, it was Roy Rogers that provided the initial spark of the Golden Age play sets in the 1950s and 60s. Playset Magazine quoted Mark, Mark's chief designer, Frank Rice, as saying, the Western Ranch playset wasn't doing as well as we'd liked, but we added Roy Rogers' name and it really took off. Roy Rogers' playsets were from the first Mark set then <clears throat> Roy Rogers' playsets were the first Mark sets that included character figures representing Wild West characters from popular television or series or movies. Though it cost the toy company more money to use the character name and likenesses, the character figure and playsets became standard Mark's practice. <clears throat> with such sets as the Alamo, Lone Ranger, Wagon Train, and Gunsmoke. In fact, some sets were created with a few character figures, simply added to the existing figures and accessories already used in previous sets. For example, Lone Ranger and Rodeo play sets were basically the same as the Roy Rogers sets, but with different character figures." End quote. The Marks Toy Company made even more play sets in the 1960s uh, and 70s, and the number of play sets based on transmedia franchises increased, including sets based on Gunsmoke, Wagon Train, The Untouchables, MGM's Ben-Hur, and more. Other companies realized the value of known franchises and hurried to buy up rights. During the 1970s, the Mego Corporation licensed Edgar Rice Burroughs' works and produced toys for Planet of the Apes, Marvel Comics, DC Comics, Star Trek franchises, and even The Wizard of Oz and its Emerald City play set. Properties that were new and not already known by the public were considered riskier. And in 1976, Mago turned down an offer to license toys based on an upcoming science fiction film named Star Wars. The license went instead to Kenner Products, who produced over 100 action figures from the original Star Wars film trilogy, along with several play sets, including the Death Star Space Station, Cantina Adventure Set, Creature Cantina Action Play Set, Death Star, Droid Factory, Land of the Jawas Action Play Set, and Millennium Falcon Spaceship. Kenner sold over 300 million Star Wars action figures, rebranded by Hasbro, Kenner's owner after 1999, and became the largest Star Wars merchandiser of the 20th century. After the first decade of the, first of the 21st century, Lego would outgrow Hasbro with the help of over 200 sets of Lego Star Wars merchandise. So on the one hand, there were building sets, which had pieces that fit together and could be assembled to represent things, though usually in more abstract ways, and the building possibilities were generally limited to vehicles and very particular kinds of structures. Also, no character figures were included in, in these sets initially, and the constructions made with them were only played with directly by, the chil by children. On the other hand, there were play sets, which could represent settings more realistically and with a much greater degree of detail. Play sets also provided figures which represented people and could be used by children to vicariously enter the world of the play set, much like the avatars in a video game represent the players and help them to vicariously enter the game's world. 
But play sets were also more limited in that they represented a single location or setting and could not be rebuilt <coughs> to represent something else. Pieces were used for one purpose and could not be reassembled into other things. The genius behind Lego then was the combining of building sets and play sets into a single product, offering the advantages of both building sets and play sets while eliminating most of the drawbacks found in both types of sets. You could build whatever you liked with Lego and take it apart and reassemble the pieces into something else. And because of all the different pieces, all of which could be connected together, Lego was more versatile than other building sets, while at the same time capable of producing rather detailed scenes and settings, and the Lego people allowed one to vicariously enter the world during play. The first Lego sets introduced the Lego system, in which every piece fit together with every other piece, and was the first such system in the toy industry. This meant that multiple sets could be combined together, allowing even larger constructions to be built, something that building sets had allowed, but play sets had not. Of course, this development did not come overnight, and the Lego brand was around for some time before they even produced the plastic bricks that became the main product for which they are known today. So the development of Lego bricks. The company now known as the Lego Group began in Denmark in the workshop of Ole Kirk Christensen, a carpenter by trade, who started producing wooden toys in 1932. In 1934, he renamed his company Lego from Leg Gott, or uh, Danish for play well. Little did he know that Lego also happens to be the Latin word for I assemble, or I put together, a name quite appropriate to the bricks that would soon come to define the company in the future. Despite a factory fire that burned down the company's buildings in 1942, the production of wooden toys would continue for the next couple of decades, along with products, other products made of wood. In 1947, Christensen brought a plastic injection molding machine and started building plastic toys along with the wood ones, including sets of blocks. Building blocks had already been made into building bricks by other companies, such as Build-A-Brick in 1934, Mini Bricks in 1935, and the interlocking building cubes patented in 1940 by British toy maker Hilary Fisher Page and his company Kittycraft. He later received patents for bricks with studs on top of them, which would allow the bricks to lock together rather than just sit atop each other. As the British patents were not protected in Denmark, the Lego group modeled their own bricks after them using the stud design and produced their automatic binding bricks in 1949. Lego would later improve the design, adding tubes to hold the pieces in place more firmly, but the idea was essentially copied from Kitty Craft's design. Lego did eventually acquire the rights to Kitty Craft in 1981, paying the new owners of the company an out-of-court settlement, finally laying to rest an old sin of the past. Building sets becoming play sets. In the early 1950s, both the Kitty Craft brick sets and Lego brick sets were still produced and marketed as building sets without the overlap of play sets that I described earlier. Some of the other plastic Lego toy, uh, toys Lego was producing were made of sometimes over a dozen plastic parts that are required assembly, moving the company one step in the direction of sets to be assembled. In 1951, Old Kirk Christensen's health declined and his son Gottfried was given control of the family business. After talking to a department store buyer on a business trip, he realized Lego could become a toy system wherein all the various parts could work together instead of being separate sets. The plastic Lego bricks were combined with small metal trees and tiny cars to be combined into a miniature town all on a vinyl playmat with roads laid out on it. The first set in the Lego system, Town Plan Number One, appeared in 1955 along with other sets that could be combined with it to enlarge the town. The cars and trees, however, were still like the plastic figures found in other play sets. Each was a single piece that could be used during play, but not changed or rebuilt into something else. And people were absent as well, except for some policemen found in set one, uh, 1271, traffic police from 1956, but these were single, unposable plastic pieces as well. 
They represented a combination of play set pieces within a building set, but they remained an addition that did not connect with Lego bricks. Before that could happen, they would have to be more integrated into the Lego system itself. The Lego system produced cars after a few years. Lego wheels and the bricks into which they attached first appeared in 1961, allowing children to build their own vehicles and allowing the wheel and wheel block pieces to be able to be attached to any other Lego pieces. But characters so crucial to the playset because of their role as children's avatars would not become part of the Lego system for some time. In 1963, Master Builder set number four had on its box cover a human-like figure built of Lego bricks, but as a construction around two dozen bricks tall, it was more of a statue than a usable avatar and too much too large to be used with typical Lego vehicles and buildings. The following year, several small sets appeared that were character-based. Seesaw, set 803, Three Little Indians, 805, Cowboys and Pony, 806, and Doll Set, uh, 905, and another set, Clowns, 321, appeared in 1965. In all these sets, the characters were still very blocky, with no faces or jointed limbs, yet they were a step closer to a usable avatar in their design and smaller size. Over, the, over these years, dozens of vehicle sets appeared, and vehicles remain the main avatars for Lego play. One set, Baggage Carts, uh, 622 of 1970, even had a few bricks that represented the cart's driver, but only as a feature of the cart rather than as a character that could be used separately. Six of the basic sets released in 1973, one, two, three, four, five, and eight, along with building set 105 and building set 115, show brick-built people amidst their scenes on their boxes, but still the blocky, faceless kind. It wasn't until 1974 that Lego finally introduced specialized pieces representing people, which had round heads, faces, and jointed arms and hands, and which were scaled to fit vehicles and buildings. Nine sets were introduced that featured these human figures, and one set, Family 200, was made up entirely of people. While the introduction of human figures broadened the possibilities for sets, the scale of these figures was still large enough that they could not be included with some sets, which had smaller vehicles and buildings representing larger structures. In 1975, a new kind of Lego figure appeared, one that did not have a face or jointed arms, but which had a specialized head along with hat pieces that could be added on, a torso piece, and a piece representing a pair of legs and feet, though there was no separation between the legs. These would be updated over the next few years until in 1978, when the modern minifigure would appear with a painted face, movable arms and legs, and hand pieces that connected to the arm pieces. Although the minifigure would eventually replace the larger Lego people, the two were produced contemporaneously and even appeared together in some sets, like mother and baby and carriage, a nursery, both from 1978, and bathroom, family room, and kitchen, all from 1979, with the minifigures positioned as babies or children, and the larger people as parents and adults. Minifigures were featured in the sets for the new town, castle, and space themes, allowing their structures to be populated with characters. Along with the new application of themes, Lego sets were now available that had all the features of other types of play sets, thus completing the merger between building sets and play sets. As the sets were designed at minifigure scale, the larger people no longer appeared in sets after 1979. Minifigures became the standard for Lego people and even have become collectibles in their own right. Themed Lego sets and later licensed properties. Some of the earliest Lego sets included brand names, mostly from the automotive industry, like the Esso Trailer, VW Beetle, and Esso Filling Station, all of 1958, or the Citroen DS19 and Fiat 1800, both of 1965, or Shell Service Station of 1971. 
For the most part, though, and despite the rise of franchising and merchandising tie-ins during the 1880s and 1990s, Lego preferred to create their own original properties. The first Lego sets in the Lego system had a town theme to them, and Lego sets with town and city themes have remained in production ever since then, although the look of these themes has changed greatly over the years as Lego sets grew in size and complexity and more specialized pieces were produced. In the late 1970s, sets were made for the town, castle, and space themes, which were fairly broad and generalist themes. These would grow more narrow as certain lines of sets would share a particular style or design. For example, the space theme sets of the 1980s and 90s, including the sub-series sets known as Futuron, Blacktron, Space Police, Mtron, Ice Planet, Spireus, Unitron, Explorians, Roboforce, and UFO. Likewise, a number of sub-series of sets would be introduced for the castle and town themes, and in 1999, the town theme would be replaced by the city theme. Themed sets meant that Lego could also be designed to connect with prevailing themes in popular culture at any given time, yet without licensing any particular property, franchise, or characters. <coughs> the appearance of a space theme in 1978 would certainly have fit in with the new popularity of science fiction projects due to the continuing success of Star Wars and its sequels. Lego also had a policy of not producing any war toys, which explains the absence of any kind of military sets. But both of these policies changed in 1999 when both Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace was released and the first of many Lego Star Wars sets appeared. The change in these decades long policies may have, be, may have been in part due to financial concerns. In 1998, the company had experienced a decline in profits for the first time since 1932, signaling that changes were needed and the company would experience further losses in 2003 and 2004. Apart from selling some foreign properties and reducing their staff in the variety of brick components produced, both about by half, Lego also changed its thinking about the kinds of toys it produced. According to reporter James Dellingpole, what Lego staff had to do was abandon their high-mindedness. Typical of this was the internal row that had broken out in 1999 when a product tie-in with Star Wars was first mooted. The older company heads had objected on the grounds that any product with wars in the title set a bad moral example. The Star Wars sets went on to become one of Lego's biggest sellers, end quote. Besides helping the company's sales, the success of these licensed sets led to the production of over 200 different Lego Star Wars sets. While Star Wars would remain the most lucrative license for the company, over the next 20 years, Lego would license other properties, <coughs> including Winnie the Pooh, Mickey Mouse, and other Disney characters, Bob the Builder, Harry Potter, Spider-Man, and later other Marvel Comics Universe characters, Dora the Explorer, Thomas the Train and Friends, Batman, and other DC Comics Universe characters, Indiana Jones, Speed Racer, Ben 10, Prince of Persia, Toy Story, The Lord of the Rings, Minecraft, Jurassic World, Pirates of the Caribbean, and many more. All of these licensed properties, along with some streamlining with the company itself, turned Lego's slump around and made the company even more successful and made it the world's most powerful brand. And Lego bricks became what one might consider a new medium as they were used as a venue for so many intellectual property franchises to release more works based on their worlds. As franchises adapt their material from one medium to another, there are often changes made during such adaptations, and the same is true for their adaptation into Lego sets, which still maintain their status as Lego bricks and use many already existing pieces in their sets. Characters especially must undergo much adaptation translating character designs into many of the existing parameters of Lego minifigures. At the same time, minifigures have undergone a few adaptations of their own in order to accommodate the franchises which they adapt. For over two decades, the standard minifigure height was about four bricks tall, and all heads were a standard shape. 
This remained the case until licensed characters required more differentiation due to character designs. Shorter legs were introduced for the Yoda figures, taller legs for the Woody figure, and molded heads for the Jar Jar Binks figure and others. Today, there are multiple torso sizes, leg sizes, head designs, skin colors, and dozens of different headpieces and accessories, and new ones are designed and introduced every year. In order to examine the adaptation of a franchise's properties into Lego, we could look at how elements of Star Wars were adapted into Lego. Adapting Star Wars into Lego. Adaptation in, into a physical playset differs from other forms of adaptation, particularly due to the kind of open-ended play that a playset encourages. Even adaptation into a sandbox style video game, which may be the form of audiovisual media closest to a playset, will generally restrict what the player can do more than a physical playset will, although a video game can also offer kinds of interaction that a physical playset cannot. Instead of merely adapting a narrative, a playset will be designed to provide its user all the elements needed to reenact a particular narrative without requiring that the narrative be reenacted. Star Wars playsets, Lego and otherwise, include models of characters, vehicles, props, and locations with which particular scenes from the movie can be reenacted by the, recreated by the user. Typically, these characters, vehicles, props, and locations will be simplified with their recognizable and distinct features exaggerated, resulting in characters that are still able to evoke their original versions. Thus, the overall shapes, color palettes, and distinctive details, particularly those clearly shown in the films, become the criteria behind the design of a Lego Star Wars set. In the world of Lego, the least charactered sets are those that are models intended for display purposes, which are not play sets, such as the models of the Lego architecture sub-brand, as well as the Star Wars sets, Star Destroyer uh, 100, 30 and Death Star 2 set 10143, which depicted the unfinished second Death Star from Return of the Jedi. But these sets are not nearly as popular as those intended as play sets, especially the ones with minifigures. For example, like the Death Star set 10188, which had a dollhouse-like design and came with 24 mini minifigures. The Death Star is not the only Star Wars spaceship to be adapted into multiple Lego sets. For example, the Millennium Falcon has appeared several times as set 7190 with 663 pieces, set 4504 with 985 pieces, set 7965 with 1,238 pieces, and set 10179 at 5,195 pieces. And as if that weren't enough, an even bigger Millennium Falcon set was released a few years later with set 75192 with 7,541 pieces. While minifigures can be used inside all four sets, only sets 1, uh, 10179 and 75192 are actually scaled to match the minifigure size and is the least character of the four sets it, it, it features the most details on the ship's exterior, as well as recreated spaces of the ship's interior. Of all the, ses, of all the Star Wars spaceship models, the first Death Star has the most iconic design because it has the recognizably, it can be recognizably represented with the simplest of graphics, a circle with a line across the diameter with a smaller circle inside the upper half of the large circle. These lines represent the two distinctive features on the Death Star's otherwise nondescript gray spherical exterior, the equatorial trench and the concave crater-like depression which focuses the multiple beams of the superlaser into one large planet-destroying beam. Thus, the first Death Star is, in a good sense, a good candidate for adaptation, since it has so few distinctive features needed for identification, making it so easily recognizable. And indeed, <coughs> the Death Star of set 10188 does have spherical shape, equatorial trench, and super laser crater, although each of these features is reproduced to a different degree. 
the adaptation of Death Star of the Death Star into set 10188. The Lego Death Star set 10, uh, 10188 was released in 2008 and included 24 minifigures, leading to its greatest, uh, leading to its greater success and desirability. Its spherical dollhouse design features four levels with four small areas at the top level, the Imperial Conference Room, a droid maintenance facility, the overbridge control room, and a gunnery area with two rotating gun towers. Four larger areas on the second level down from the top, docking bay 327, the super laser fire control room, the detention block, and the emperor's throne room. Five areas on the third level down, the garbage compactor room, tractor beam controls, the chasm that Luke swings across, to which extends down to the bottom level, a garage-like work area, and a laser cannon room. And finally, four smaller areas of hallways and storage on the very bottom level, which is harder to access due to the overhanging level above. These areas contain very little and are not themed to any specific locations in the films. Finally, an elevator shaft is set vertically into the center of the model, connecting all the levels together with an open-sided elevator. The inclusion of the Emperor's throne room, along with minifigures of two red-cloaked Imperial guards, the Emperor, and a black-suited, short-haired Jedi Luke, and images on the box showing Luke in a lightsaber fight with Darth Vader, indicate that the set was designed <coughs> for reenactment of scenes occurring on both the first and second Death Stars, though all the other scenes are from the first Death Star. Unlike the largest Millennium Falcon sets, however, the Death Star set is not at all to scale. In fact, set 10188 is still by far the most out of scale of all the Star Wars Lego sets. According to various Star Wars sources, the first Death Star is said to internally have 84 levels each of which is composed of 357 sublevels for a total of 29,988 sublevels. And the diameters of the first and second Death Stars are, according to official figures, 160 kilometers or 99.4194 miles and 900 kilometers or, 50, or 559 miles respectively. Assuming the typical minifigure height is being scaled to about six feet, scale models of the two Death Stars would have, have to have diameters of about two miles and 11 miles, respectively. Thus, set 10188 is out of scale by several orders of magnitude, even for the smaller of the two Death Stars. But a playset, of course, is judged by what it enables its users to do. And in the case of a playset licensed from a movie, how well it allows scenes from the movie to be reenacted. So how well does set 10188 represent the Death Stars as seen in episodes uh, four and six? Play sets simplify features and character them to some degree while still trying to keep them recognizable, which is especially important for a licensed property, which is often known for a specific design. Unlike themes like the original town, castle, and space themes, which only needed to be representative in a general way, licensed sets like Star Wars have many expectations in regard to their design. Starting at the top of the Death Star set, we can compare the two gun towers with those found in the film. They manage to convey the shape of the guns fairly well, and what's more, they both rotate in unison like those in the film, and their guns can be moved up and down as well. The largest exterior feature, however, is the super laser crater. With a design like a spherical dollhouse, the Death Star lacks an exterior shell and thus has fewer exterior features. The equatorial trench is only represented by a layer of gray bricks separating the upper lower halves, but the super laser crater is present and firing. The crater's disc is attached to a gun mount, making it movable and positionable, unlike in the film, combining its properties with those of a laser cannon, like the one on the level immediately below it. Since the two kinds of weaponry have a similar function, it makes sense that they would be connected in a simplification of the Death Star's defenses. The Death Star set's interior recreates a number of locations from the film. The rescue sequence of the film takes place in the detention block, Leia's cell, and the garbage compactor room, all of which are connected together, the action moving from one location to the next. 
not only are all three locations represented in set 10188, but they are connected together there as well. First, we can compare the detention block to the one in the film. The overall color scheme of black, white, and gray and red is kept, as is the hexagonal shape of the cell block hallway, and the door of Leia's cell opens onto the hallway as it does in the film. Other details are represented, like the row of white circles above the doorway where Chewbacca is standing, and the angled shape of the black control consoles set in a semicircle. Even a small detail, like a door control panel, is reproduced and charactered, yet recognizable in form, even though the, the actual arrangement of the features is not exact. The cell block hallway also has a breakaway section that lets the minifigures fall into the garbage compactor room right below the cell block in the level below it. The garbage compactor room is likewise well represented by the design of the Lego set. The color palette is the same, the walls are hinged and can close in, and the doorway is roughly the same shape with the same pattern of eight red lights reproduced above it. Even the junk found on the floor is similar and includes the segmented pipes the characters in the film use uh, to try to slow down the movement of the walls. The door can also be slid open as the characters are rescued. In the film, while Luke and his friends in the garbage, uh, while Luke and his friends in the garbage compactor room are in the garbage compactor room, C, uh, C-3PO and R2-D2 are in the control room, which overlooks docking bay 327, where the Millennium Falcon is docked. Both the control room and docking bay 327 are represented in set 10188 and are arranged so that the control room overlooks the docking bay as it does in the film. Although there are variations in the overall design, the various designs are all present as one can see in this comparison. Likewise, the docking bay itself is similarly represented with the white highlights of lights going up the walls, the white arrows on the floor, and the white outline around the rectangular hole in the floor. The doorway also has the shape of a rectangle with its corners truncated with a row of dark windows around it. While the bay is too tiny to house even the smallest Millennium Falcon model, it does have a mount on which to hang Darth Vader's TIE fighter, which is included with set 10188. The 24 minifigures that come with the set also try to reproduce the characters' costume designs. Due to costume changes in the film, there are three Luke Skywalker minifigures included, each in a different costume. One is Luke in the white desert outfit he's wearing at the beginning of the film. One is Luke disguised as a stormtrooper for the rescue sequence. And finally, there is one of Luke dressed in black as a Jedi, as he is at the end of episode uh, six, Return of the Jedi. This last Luke is included because, as stated earlier, Set 10188 depicts not only locations from the first Death Star in Episode 4, but also the Emperor's Throne Room from the second Death Star, which is seen in Episode 6. Although the Jedi Luke, although Jedi Luke, there are many figures of the, um, along with Jedi Luke, there are many, uh, many figures of the Emperor and two of his guards in their red outfits. The Throne Room, uh, Oops, I forgot to, okay, there we go. Um, the Emperor, uh, the last Luke is included because as stated earlier, set 10188 depicts not only locations from the first Death Star, but also the Emperor's throne room from the second Death Star, which is seen in episode six. Along with Jedi Luke, there are many figures of the Emperor and two of his guard in their red outfits. The throne room has the stairs, rings of consoles, and circular window to match the set in the film, as well as the Emperor's rotating chair in front of the window and the chasm into which he falls. These are, there are several other areas in which scenes from the films can be reenacted. The Imperial Conference Room, the Overbridge Control Room, the chasm that Luke swings across as Leia holds onto him, an elevator, the tractor beam control that Obi-Wan shuts off, and more. In fact, we can calculate just how well set 10188 provides locations in which scenes from the film can be reenacted in the play set. In episode five and episode four, the scenes taking place in the Death Star's interior 
<coughs> take 34 minutes and 11 seconds in the film and can be broken down into a list of the various scenes and locations. Most are represented in set 10188, and there are only 41 seconds of screen time at locations not represented by the set. This means that more than 98% of episode four's Death Star scenes can be reenacted in the play set, which is a very high percentage indeed, and also demonstrates the clever design of 10188 that is able to include so much of the film despite the limited space inside the spherical shape of the play set. The design of the Lego Death Star set 10, uh, 10188 proves and provides an example of all the various elements that have made Lego into the world's greatest toy and play set. To sum up, Lego brought together all of the advantages of building sets with those of play sets, providing endless possibilities for building as well as suggested designs for constructions around each set as designed. Lego minifigures act as avatars, which allow one to vicariously enter the building constructions and their near endless flexibility make them as adaptable as are the Lego sets themselves. Lego is both a medium and a venue into which any character-based or world-based franchise can be translated and adapted while still retaining the Lego style imposed by the bricks from which they are made. A partnership with Lego is something beneficial to both Lego as well as to the intellectual property that becomes adapted to it. And Lego is also one of those rare toys that is popular beyond childhood and has become an intergenerational phenomenon, providing something that can be enjoyed by people of all ages, bringing them together for playful activities. As these images show, there are many adult fans of Lego who use it as a medium for a wide range of creations and a lifelong hobby of building. And that is it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. That was a whole ton of information. I appreciate that. And um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to type them into the chat box. And Mark will be happy to answer questions. Um, if we don't have any questions, you can always email us if you have questions afterwards. And um, the presentation will be available on our website. It, it takes us usually about a day or two to get it up and running on the website, but it will be available for anyone who wants to view it in the future. Um, we do have um, one that says, comment on, uh, please comment on the impact of Technics line of parts to the brand. Can you comment oh, on that, Mark? The Technics line, yes. Um, I didn't really talk about that, but that's uh, for older, <clears throat> older users, something that started in the, I believe around the 1980s, and they were much more technical models. In fact, I remember they had a car that actually had a stick shift and a gear and a gearbox in there to actually go at different rates, and it was it was very very detailed, and something really more for uh, teenagers. I think it was more of an interest. It was an attempt to interest uh, teenagers into Lego because there's such a thing that that in the Lego studies they kind of call the dark ages of Lego, which is between when you're being when you're a kid and when you're an adult fan of Lego, kind of in the teen years when you really don't play with Lego anymore. And I think that the uh, the Technics was an uh, an attempt to try to get that audience that otherwise would be lost. Um, nowadays they also have some robotic sets uh, that use Lego and things like that. So there's there's ways that they try to keep people interested in Lego all the way through from childhood to adulthood. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. That is really interesting, you know. Um, use Technics parts as part of an electrical engineering. Oh, yes. Um, this person who I happen to know, he says that he um, used Technics parts as part of an electrical engineering class project as part of a, a transfer crane. Next comment is, can you comment on free play with Legos versus, versus structured play sets? Okay, there's, yeah, there's actually been study on things like that. And even um, like at some 
places where they have like um, uh, these seminars for managers and teams, they will actually give them Lego bricks and like have them just build things and things like that. So even at, at uh, these kinds of business seminars, they use things like that. I think the thing about Lego too, is that you have both of those things in there. Uh, it does have instructions for building, but kids can build whatever they want with them, especially when you have multiple sets and you start building things together. And I know, I, I think our house where we have a lot of Lego, You froze up a little bit, Mark. I think I think his video froze. I don't know if everybody else can hear me. 